everybody. It's Dr. Sandy Laura Kramer, one of the board certified surgeons at Visionary Eye Doctors. Thank you again for joining us for the EYE Show podcast. Today, we're going to talk about Horner's syndrome, which is an uncommon condition. And this came up yesterday because one of our team members showed me a picture of her husband and she said, oh my gosh, Dr. Kramer's, look at my husband. I'm going to just show and we'll put the picture up look what happened to his eyelid. And so I looked at him and was like, huh, what's going on? So we were talking a little bit about what it possibly could be. And so if you look at the picture, you'll see that his right upper lid, and we're posting this, the right upper lid is a little droopy and the left upper lid is maybe a little bit higher. The right pupil is a little smaller and the left pupil is a little bigger. Now, which one is the abnormal side? So I didn't see the previous uh, pictures, but well, usually when we have a patient like this in the office, we'll look at the old kind of driver's license or old photos to see which one is the abnormal side. So there's some things that are going through the doctor's brain or what will go through your brain if you ever see the eyelid drooping on one side or the pupil is smaller on one side compared to the other. So this is the kind of thought process that's going that was going through my head as I looked at the photo and that was going through the doctor's head who, who saw uh, her husband yesterday. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the things that are not dangerous and the things that'll kill you. So that's why we're gonna talk a little bit about Horner syndrome because it is one of those things that we get a little nervous about because within Horner syndrome are a list of possibilities that could kill you. The most common cause of just lid drooping is just aging, uh, rubbing the right eye. That tends to be the eye that tends to droop more for years and years and years where you develop something called ptosis, uh, PT, I think we'll put that P-T-S-O, ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S. That means the eyelid is drooping and usually it'll happen both lids together, but sometimes one will happen more than the other. It can happen after any eye surgery, the eyelid, because as we get older, no longer is elastic, the muscles, the as we open the eyelid with a speculum, the eyelid doesn't go back up after the surgery, which is very rare, but can happen. And so patients that have trauma, of course, there can be a ptosis. Uh, there can be thyroid issues. That's the number one thing we think of when we see any eyelid issue ever is a thyroid problem. But when the pupil starts to get involved as well, we get a little bit more nervous. So pupil abnormalities in and of themselves, if you have a friend that has a different pupil size, the most common cause is genetic, congenital, 80s pupil, uh, hypertonic, clonic, pupil. So there's a little issue with the nerve uh, innervation of that. And I'll show you in just a minute of how that happens. But that's the most common cause of just a pupil abnormality. When you have an eyelid drooping and you have a small pupil on the same side, we get worried about something called Horner syndrome. And Horner syndrome was named after a doctor, uh, Dr. Horner, who first described it many years ago of ptosis, meaning the eyelid drooping, meiosis, which means the pupil is small, and anhydrosis, meaning you don't sweat on that same side, the ipsilateral side of the lesion of the spot of the nerve we're going to go through in just a few minutes that's occurring in the sympathetic pathway. So Horner syndrome has a whole list of things that can cause it. And so I'm going to show, we're going to post this on the um, YouTube version of this, but basically we have something called the autonomic nervous system. That's in charge of your whole body's non-voluntary system of reflexes, nerve pathways. That's in charge of your respiratory rate, your heart rate, your pupil size, uh, your different types of uh, pathways that control all those things. And within the autonomic nervous system, there's a sympathetic pathway, and it's a whole cascade of nerves that are in charge of the sympathetic pathway and the parasympathetic pathway. The sympathetic pathway is in charge of your flight and fight and flight response. So let's say you see a, uh, you know, a lion, a tiger, your heart rate's going to go up, your blood pressure's going to go up, your stomach is going to stop kind of perfusing itself. All the blood vessels are going to kind of try to constrict and your heart rate's going to go up. And that's a sympathetic pathway. The parasympathetic pathway does the complete opposite. It's a whole chain of nerves that basically are in charge of decreasing your heart rate and your blood pressure and Im improving the perfusion of your stomach. So the parasympathetic pathway is often called the rest and digest pathway. Uh, so just to keep that in mind. So when there's a Horner syndrome, it means a sympathetic pathway. There's a problem in the sympathetic pathway in your fight and flight response. And that can cause the pupil to constrict because usually when you're excited and, and your adrenaline is increasing, your pupil will dilate. And usually when you're excited and, and your catecholamines are increasing, your, pup your eyelid will start you know, raising up a little bit. Uh, and, and you might start sweating. Uh, but if there's a problem in the sympathetic pathway, the opposite is true. The pupil will constrict, 
the lid will droop a little bit and you won't sweat on that side. And so there's different kind of what we call first order defects, second order defects, and third order defects of so these neurons. So when we look at the sympathetic pathway, it starts off in the hypothalamus, that's in the center of your brain, and the first order neuron that actually cables, so it's like three TV cables connected together or three extension cords connected together. The first extension cord goes from the center of your brain to basically the T1 in your spine, and that is sometimes affected by tumors of the lung or the uh, kind of central kind of nervous system or kind of your neck have defects in that. The second order pathway is goes from the center of your neck to basically called the cervical ganglion, which is located uh, kind of higher in your neck. There's three ganglions, the uh, first uh, inferior, middle, and superior cervical ganglion. And so the connection of the extension cord, the first extension cord connecting to the second, second extension cord happens in the superior cervical ganglion. And those types, when we isolate that, depending on some ways we can do that, can be due to a lung problem like tuberculosis, a uh, pulmonary apex problem, or some trauma in that location. Uh, or sometimes you might even start to get a, a sign that there might be an aneurysm that's happening on the internal carotid artery, but that's usually from a third order defect. So the third extension cord, when it connects in that area here, goes all the way to your pupil, and that's called the oculosympathetic pathway. And where that occurs is that if you have a tumor in the cavernous sinus or some type of inflammation in that area, you can sometimes get a Horner syndrome because of some problem in your orbital area Area or right behind your orbital area in the cavernous sinus. So when we see a patient like this, we used to do cocaine drops, apoclonidine drops. We would do drops to see if the pupil would dilate with the apoclonidine, and that would help us determine where the uh, defect was. Was it a first order, second order, or third order? Now we just get an MRI or CAT scan, so it makes it much easier. And some doctors don't even do the cocaine test to kind of see where the defect is unless it's very hard to pinpoint with MRI, which is very, very rare. Uh, a friend of mine recently had actually a Horner syndrome in her 40s, and she had some neck pain. So she went to the doctor, they did an MRI. Actually, I think they did an ultrasound first, and then they did the MRI, but they found that she had an internal carotid artery dissection, and that's why she had the Horner syndrome. And for her, she actually did well and only needed baby aspirin for now the rest of her life, uh, but it wasn't something that killed her, but that could kill her. Uh, tumors in the cavernous sinus, of course, could kill you. Dissections, meaning the uh, when you have like a dissection, what it's like is is a uh, straw that you used to drink out of, and within the lumen of the straw, there's the thickness of the straw's kind of wall. The wall separates, and so if it's a blood vessel and the lumen separates, the, the wall of the blood vessel separates, I should say, then the blood doesn't go where it needs to go, and it can kill you instantly. Very, very dangerous. So she actually happened to have that, and she was very lucky to still be alive, but she was she had that, and she had the Horner syndrome. So what did we do for this patient? So we, of course, had him see an ophthalmologist the same day, and the ophthalmologist took a look and tried try to determine, well, is it a Horner syndrome? And what we try to do is, if you have a patient like this or you yourself are concerned, you go into a dark room and we see if the pupil will dilate. If the pupil on that right side will not dilate, often there's a sympathetic problem. Or we have the patients really, you know, run up, run really hard and try to sweat and make sure they sweat on both sides. As long as they sweat on both sides, then yes, that's usually not a Horner syndrome and we don't have to necessarily run for an you know, MRI and so forth. This particular patient actually seemed to dilate in the dark without a problem, was able to sweat on both sides. And so we then started thinking about, wait a second, what about the other eye? Is it a thyroid issue? So that's where we are right now is we're gonna do a thyroid function test, see if it's a thyroid where the left eye is actually maybe the problem eye. The left eye, the eyelid is retracting a little bit and because of the muscles around the eye may be inflamed. If it turns out it's neither one, then sometimes it can be something called uh, crocodile tears and, and an aberration of nerve innervation where the person will actually have an abnormality in the eyelid just from previous trauma, uh, previous infection. So that's unlikely, but possibility. 
but he doesn't really have crocodile tears, so I don't think that's going to be his diagnosis. Anyway, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Horner syndrome for patients in case you ever run across a family member or yourself where you have an eyelid drooping or your pupil looks a little smaller. That's the thing we're looking for to make sure it's not dangerous. If you ever have a patient or a person that you see that has been hit by a car or a trauma or something like that where the pupil is very big or both pupils are very big, then yes, that's a medical emergency. The pupil is blown. There's a risk that the person could die because there's an issue with with the brain actually being so affected that the pupil has no reaction. And of course, that is something that you, of course, call 911. Anyway, I hope you found this podcast helpful. Thank you for joining us for the EYE Show podcast.